Okay. So once again, welcome. This is your official welcome uh, to those of you who are in the space and to those who are viewing the recording. We also thank you for joining in. Um, as I said before, food is what's bringing us together tonight. Um, and that's often the case for food, right? It's an intersection point at many times. And we all have our own food stories, but not all of those food stories have happy parts in them, right? Um, I'm especially proud to be facilitating this program not only because it can highlight some evidence-based resources that Division of Extension provides and that our local programmers are using in the county, also because it highlights a local solution that's led by a community partner, and especially because we're also going to be highlighting youth tonight. And I really congratulate our three youth leaders who are in this space because they've obviously identified and dedicated their time to the importance of food at a much younger age than I did because I wasn't thinking about food in such a meaningful way at that time. So with that, um, I am going to pass it off to Lindsay Day Farnsworth, who will be our first presenter, followed by Caleb Locrans and Jarmari Jarrett, Hannah Ellis and Jacob Bernal, our Fresh Start Youth Leaders. Thank you, Aaron. I'll go ahead and get started um, and activate screen sharing here. What are you doing, Doggy? Can everyone, can you see my screen okay? You get right. in the chapel. So, um, I'm going to cover a lot of territory in a short period of time in an effort to highlight some of the major failings present and historical in the food system. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time on discussing some efforts underway to build more just and resilient food systems uh, through extension and in the communities that we work with. And I'm going to confess up front that um, I'm guilty of really text heavy slides. So just bear with me because I know that Caleb has promised lots of pretty pictures of gardens to come at the end. So we'll, we'll get to the good stuff eventually. Um, I wanted to start with um, talking a little bit about uh, food security, um, since hunger is one of the first things that comes to mind when we think about what's wrong with the food system. I wanted to talk about how food security is defined, what characterizes it, and why it matters, and use that as an entree to look at how food insecurity is a byproduct of and in many ways mirrors patterns of racialized poverty across the food system. So food security is simply defined as household level economic and social condition of limited or uncertain access to adequate food. And basically, uh, as a definition, it's calculated based on um, a survey not unlike the census that records responses to a series of questions about conditions and behaviors that characterize households that are having difficulty meeting their food needs. So that's just sort of the what goes into the statistics when you hear people throw the number around. Prior to the pandemic, there was actually um, a 20 year low in our food uh, insecurity rate at the national level. So it was hovering around 11%. And when I dug into the numbers at the state level, we were pretty much at parity, so about the same. Um, but it's important to note that food insecurity varies wildly, um, both geographically and across demographics. So very often, uh, the food insecurity rate that you see for a region is much higher if you look at the child food insecurity rate, which is a concern that I'll touch on in a moment. Um, and also, you know, when you're looking at a number that, that captures the state or the nation as a whole, you're really missing on uh, missing variation at the local level. So prior to the pandemic, and again, we don't have good numbers on pandemic level food insecurity yet, um, in Ozaukee County, Wisconsin, the food insecurity rate was below 6%. And in Menominee County, it was almost three times that at greater than 17%. So you can see that it's really in the fine grain where you start to see nuance. Um, factors that contribute to food security can be long-term or temporary. So a job loss for a family or other destabilizing um, factors like a separation between spouses or whatever can, can certainly contribute to, to food insecurity. Um, but the major contributing factors are economic stability. So um, 
food insecurity is often tied to income and employment and, and whether you know, individuals are earning um, a living wage, which is gonna come up again and again in this presentation. Relatedly, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color or Bi BIPOC folks experience disproportionately high rates of food insecurity, um, both in our country and, and in our state. Again, drawing on pre-pandemic numbers, it was one in about 12 um, non-Hispanic white folks that were, were experiencing food insecurity um, prior to the pandemic, but that number was as high as one in six Latino or Latinx individuals, one in five um, Black individuals, and one in four Native Americans. And in, in fact, in a report just as, as recent as this March, Feeding America was projecting that Black individuals in the U.S. were likely to experience food insecurity this year at a rate double that of, um, of white um, Americans. Hopefully our bounce back uh, from the pandemic will, will um, sort of stem um, those projections and, and it won't come to that. But you can see that, that these disparities, um, again, are, are significant and, and clearly racialized. Um, so another um, thing that I wanted to highlight is, you know, in addition to the immediate stress and strain of food insecurity, there are other well-documented uh, effects. And this is probably not news to, to many of you, but long-term negative impacts of food insecurity broadly fall under two categories. There are health outcomes and non-nutritional outcomes. And as you can see, particularly for young people, but really across the age groups, and, and perhaps it's just mainly because young, young people are studied um, more in terms of the impacts of, of food insecurity, but we see long-term negative effects and they're fairly wide ranging, um, you know, from asthma to anemia, to hospitalization, poor general health, worse uh, oral health, to cognitive and behavioral problems, anxiety, depression. Um, some studies have even suggested that suicidal ideation can be increased uh, related to the stress and strain of food insecurity. So again, not a direct nutritional impact of it, um, but a reflection of the stress that it puts upon an individual and a household. And I have a quote from, from Howard on the screen that just sort of highlights the challenges that it presents for children um, in, in pretty formative ways in terms of interpersonal uh, relationship development, self-control, and certainly um, learning. So obviously these in and of themselves are, are significant concerns and, and warrant our attention. But I'm speaking from the position of the Community Food Systems Program at Extension and kind of wanted to zoom out and look at some of the broader surrounding um, issues that, that food um, insecurity is, is really sort of nested in. So um, food issues related to, to food access and, and security or insecurity rather are not the only ways that the conventional food system is falling short. At virtually every phase of the food supply chain, which is that inner circle there, and extends from uh, land access and suitability all the way to resource and waste recovery, we find that the legacy and perpetuation of practices that degrade people and the environment. And these practices are often reinforced by factors in that enabling environment, so that outer circle um, that monetize them, codify them through laws, or normalize them through culture. So I'm gonna spend the next couple of minutes highlighting a couple of different examples um, of different phases of the food supply chain and, and the ways that they've been broken historically and, and that we continue to feel um, the legacy of, of these laws and, and norms in our culture. And then we're gonna pivot to, um, to some more sort of positive uh, locuses of change. So certainly a foundation for agricultural production is access to land and preferably fertile land. But for non-whites in the US, this has been a major hurdle. Um, for Native Americans, certainly there's, there's been centuries of systematic massive land dispossession that was institutionalized through law and policy. So for example, in 1828, the Supreme Court ruled that indigenous peoples could live in, on United States land, but could not hold title since the United States, quote unquote, right of discovery superseded Native people's right of occupancy. And we see the reverberation of, um, of this decision throughout the 19th century. So by the end of the century, um, through the, the General Allotment Act, we saw the seizure of more than 100 million acres just between the late 1880s and early 1930s of, of land that had previously belonged to Native Americans. Um, 
and certainly for African Americans too, the the history of land access has been been a tumultuous one. Um, following enslavement, there was a period of modest gains um, to land access during the Reconstruction era through legislation such as the Southern Homestead Act, but um, blowback from Southern Democrats, poor quality land, land cost, and inheritance laws all caused um, contributed to subsequent land loss. So again, um, you know, we just continue to see a real bias towards um, you know, the accru uh, accruing wealth and land, um, mostly to white folks, you know, certainly as we move across the country and, and even when there were attempts to, um, to reverse some of these policies. Lindsay, I, yeah. I apologize for interrupting you. Could you possibly put the presentation full screen? Sure. Thank you. Yep. Sorry about that. Does that appear okay? We can still see the next slide notes coming up, but it is a little more front and center than it was. Okay. I apologize for that. Um, so I wanted to provide a little bit of a regional example um, of Native American land dispossession. And I've borrowed this slide from a colleague, Jennifer Gothier, who is from the Menominee Nation and also an extension um, colleague at Menominee County. And as you can see here, the orange area on that map was the original ancestral territory of the Menominee Nation um, in comparison to that small white rectangle that, that I've circled on the screen there. Um, and that represents a decrease in their original land from 10 million acres um, to just over 235,000 acres over um, the, the period of um, several hundred years. In the next slide, Jennifer has highlighted um, the process by which the Menominee um, experienced major changes in their economy, their food system, their relationship to the land and the land itself. Um, summarizing it in terms of 339 years of significant losses. And considering this, perhaps it's not a surprise that today Menominee County has the highest rate of food insecurity in Wisconsin and the lowest county health ranking. So here on the screen, you can see that compared to um, state averages, they have a much higher rate of um, you know, diet related disease, children living in poverty, um, premature death, et cetera. Certainly all evidence of, of a legacy of being disconnected from their food systems, from their land, um, and, and from traditions. Thankfully, there's, um, there's some cause for hope later in this story. The intent is not just to, to highlight the things that have, um, have really gone wrong. So moving from land access and suitability to agricultural production, um, you know, we, we see similar themes. Over 150 years after the abolishment of slavery, our agricultural system is still heavily dependent on a largely undercompensated workforce. So for example, farm workers remain um, excluded from many of the legal protections that are available to other workers. And these exclusions have roots in labor laws that were passed in the early 20th century. And they were justified on grounds that farming at the time was often a family operation with relatively few waged laborers. Certainly this hasn't been true for many decades, but large scale farms and their lobbies have successfully maintained claims about farming, the farming sector's um, exceptional, exceptionalism. We also see payment structures that perpetuate poverty wages and discourage, discourage workplace um, conditions um, through, you know, through um, you know, disincentivizing folks from taking water and, and shade breaks. So, and then moving on to other segments of the food system, including food processing, um, retail, and, and institutional preparation, um, you can see here that in a, a survey last year of, or a, a study by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, six of the 10 lowest paying, paying jobs in the US, this is a, apart from agri the agricultural workforce, um, are in the food system. So with dishwashers coming in at the lowest, followed by restaurant, hotels, uh, hosts and hostesses, fast food workers, um, food preparation staff, restaurant wait staff, and, and cooks. Just a second here.
On these slides, I wanted to just highlight the ways that structural racism is embedded in the food system. So this date, this report is relatively dated at this point, and I'd love to see the study conducted again, because I think it brings up some key points that um, are certainly still salient if the exact numbers are, are not, um, not as current as they might be. But here you can just see a disproportionately high representation of people of color in positions across the food chain um, relative to their white counterparts. And the next slide shows that phase uh, in each phase of the food system, um, BIPOC folks are receive lower compensation um, than their white counterparts in production, in processing, in distribution. So to recap, Black, Indigenous, and people of color are more likely than white people um, to experience food insecurity. BIPOC individuals are overrepresented in low-wage jobs across the food system, and the food system reproduces food insecurity through systems and structures that inequitably allocate land, resources, opportunity access, and wages. So where do we go from here? What does food security look like and what are alternatives? The simplest definition of food security is access by all people at all times to enough food um, for an active, healthy lifestyle. But many people go further than that, arguing that this definition overemphasizes access while failing to take into account cultural and, and structural considerations. So for example, a colleague of mine, um, Judy Bartfeld, who's a food security specialist, at UW-Madison often talks about the four pillars of food security. And rather than it being strictly about access in the broadest sense or whether a family has enough food at any given time, she really sort of breaks that down. What are the components that, that collectively make it possible for a family to put food um, on their tables, drawing from, from different supply chains and, and sources and mechanisms? So the first and foremost um, is economic security. And, and that obviously, you know, aligns with what I highlighted at the beginning is the, the most um, influential factor in terms of whether a household has enough food. And this is, of course, because exp food expenses are often some of the first expenses that get cut when money is tight. Correspondingly, Judy would note that good jobs, affordable housing, health care, and a strong income safety net are also um, all important factors that contribute to a household and community's economic security. Um, the second pillar is robust uh, federal food and nutrition programs, such as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Here in Wisconsin, that's known as Food Share. School meal programs, summer meal programs, WIC and senior meal programs are also a part um, of the suite of resources that are, are crucial in terms of providing you know, year-round access um, to, to quality food for folks. The next component is um, a strong emergency food security network. So these are the food banks and, and food pantries that people rely on, and they provide a critical backstop. Um, in some cases, for folks, um, you know, there'll be sources of, of long-term food security, and in other cases, you know, individuals between periods of um, unemployment or um, during other challenging times, you know, might rely on them for a short period of time. So. Um, a good complement to some of those federal programs. And then the fourth pillar are vibrant, accessible, and affordable food systems. And um, Judy describes this as seamless access to affordable and healthy food through a diverse and economically sound network of producers, distributors, and retail outlets. So um, these are not necessarily situations where people would be getting you know, access to, to free or reduced food, um, but you know, having grocery stores that have affordable product um, that, that are accessible to you um, is also an important part of, of that broader system. Um, from my vantage point, we, we think about food systems a little bit differently, and that kind of gets into the next slide. So another way to think about food security is community food security. And this is um, a broader account uh, that, that focuses not just on food access, but also on cultural relevance, justice, and sustainability. Um, and this is, this is really sort of the framework that we use at Extension to help us think about how we want to approach our, our programming, at least in the Community Food Systems Program. Um, so I just want to take a, a moment to, to sort of focus on, on this definition, and then um, I'm going to get into a, a sort of a corresponding framework. And that's, um, again, community food security is a condition in which all community residents obtain a safe, culturally appropriate, nutritionally sound diet 
through an economically and environmentally sustainable food system that promotes community reliance and social justice. So that's a lot to unpack, and I'm going to try to do just that um, you know, in the next slide and, and through a couple of examples. So um, here's a framework that was developed by a, a UW Madison project in partnership with Extension a couple of years ago. And you can see that it expands on the graphic that I shared in earlier slides. So here we have community and regional food projects, programs, and policies that trigger interactions between the different components of the framework, which in turn affects their outcomes. So for example, if we make or change policy, so that would be in this outer circle here, um, we're modifying the components of the enabling environment to alter specific food systems activities in that inner circle to achieve some social, environmental, or economic outcome. So an example that I sometimes use is the USDA Value Added Producers Grant Program. Um, this is a USDA grant program that's administered by state departments of agriculture. So it's a policy intervention. It would go in the outer uh, circle there. Um, and it's used to incentivize changes in agricultural production, processing, marketing, and consumption. So say a producer right now just grows tomatoes. This is an opportunity for them to expand their market by maybe also making tomato sauce. Um, so that's going to enhance their market access. Um, and the same would be true for other state or federal grant programs where we're really trying to sort of modify the, the stages of the food supply chain and who has access um, to markets uh, as a result of, of policy in, and investment. And, and this, in this case, the, the goal that that's trying to address, address on the, the left side um, of this, we used to call it sort of the, the bicycle chain, is thriving local economies. Um, and I just you know, want to speak to that left side. What matters in terms of this, this left wheel and the values that are in it is that that's what differentiates policies that promote sustainable and community, community food systems from conventional food systems. Um, it's not just about scale or geographic proximity, which folks often think about in terms of local food, but it's about the social, ecological, and economic goals and outcomes of the system. And it's with this thinking in mind that Extension is developing some of its new community food systems programs. And, and we're actually in the process of finalizing um, a plan right now. Um, how am I doing for time, Erin? You know, maybe about five to seven more minutes. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm on target then, thank you. Okay, perfect. So um, last year, we, we launched our Food Entrepreneurship Ecosystem Development Project. And this effort was built on, on research, um, national research that showed that business ownership is an important vehicle for, for wealth creation, especially among um, members of disadvantaged communities. Some of our partners at the Ag and Applied Economics Department here at Madison have also found that um, Black, Indigenous, and, and people of color entrepreneurs often um, they actually have a fairly large percentage of, of small food businesses in Wisconsin compared to some of the other sectors. But uh, research has shown that they lack connectivity to formal um, business networks and lenders. And so our thinking here was if business um, ownership is an important vehicle for wealth creation, then how can we help BIPOC entrepreneurs and food entrepreneurs in particular um, tap into existing networks across the state? Many parts of the state have you know, reasonably robust um, small business support infrastructure. Um, so the question was not really how to reproduce that, but how to connect BIPOC food entrepreneurs to those networks. And then in some cases, connect um, them also with food um, safety training, which is one of the ways that, that food businesses are, are unique and can present some challenges um, that more traditional small business assistance providers can't provide. Um, so in short, this program is really striving to increase the proportion and success of BIPOC food entrepreneurs in the state, uh, as well as limited English speakers, uh, recent immigrants, and, and others experiencing structural barriers to food business entrepreneurship. And at, at the moment, there are three central components of this project. Um, one are no-cost online trainings. We actually have a series coming up um, next month that blend food business development and food safety training on how to navigate licensing in state 
Right now, those are offered through um, English and Spanish. We're, we're developing a couple sessions that are going to be Spanish only, and we're also working on rolling out um, some Hmong language resources. Um, those trainings will be available for those who aren't able to attend in, in person or, or want to sort of loop back and revisit some sections of them later. They'll be available online, um, accompanied by fact sheets that are in all of those languages as well. And then we recently wrote a USDA grant that we're hoping will get funded um, that can sort of super boost our work to, to develop a statewide food entrepreneurship um, network. And so if it's funded, we both have a, a BIPOC peer-to-peer -peer, um, food entrepreneur network, as well as um, more network development among our extension educators across the state to support this work. Um, another priority um, for the Community Food Systems Program is policy, food systems policy and planning. Um, extension educators in various parts of the state already play a supportive and advisory role with various food policy councils and planning activities at the local level. And um, food policy is a priority for the program precisely because as the slide notes there, policy can be both a function of action or it can be a function of omission. And we wanted to make sure that communities are taking decisive actions to support their food systems um, you know, if and, and, and when they want to. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with food policy councils, this is one of the main ways that, that our program members have been supporting this work at the local level. Food policy councils bring together stakeholders from different parts of the, the local food sector to examine how the food system's operating and to develop some recommendations for how to improve it. Sometimes this is just organizing across existing organizations, whether they're um, food pantries or nonprofits. Sometimes they work more closely with county or municipal government to affect changes at the policy level. Um, here in Madison, we have a couple of mini grants programs, one that supports community markets and another that supports nonprofits or community groups that are doing various community-based projects. Uh, and across the state, we're trying to build extension capacity to support local food work in, in locations where there's interest, either in having formal food policy councils or less formal food coalitions um, to, to increase the impact of individual organizations and, and their impact collectively. There's a lot to unpack on this slide, but this is just to highlight that um, at the local level, there's a tremendous amount that you can do to affect changes from production all the way again to, to resource and waste management at the end, whether that's grocery store attraction or urban agriculture ordinances. And um, right now, there's, there's been so much work that's done, communities really don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so this, this is another way that we're trying to be um, sort of a clearinghouse for uh, local partners that would like to move into these spaces. Um, there's, there are a lot of great toolkits and resources out there. And, and so you, know, you can kind of identify what the need is or where you're trying to go. Um, it's our hope that, that we can provide support for you in getting there. I would say this is the least well-developed of the um, priority areas in our current plan. And, and that's just because um, you know, this relies really heavily on, on partnerships um, that in many places we're still developing. But I'd say within food sovereignty and justice, the, the main initiatives that we have underway right now are community and market gardens um, and an effort to, to restore access um, to land for production. So there are a number of um, Latino or Latinx and, and Hmong producers that operate market gardens in different parts of the state and community gardens, of course, are also um, opportunities for a variety of other extension programming. So, you know, I know that, that um, soon we'll be talking about youth engagement in gardens. Um, there are also veterans gardens and therapy gardens in, in um, Milwaukee County and um, a number of other garden related projects across the state. So right now we're supporting some partners some extension partners in, in really documenting the impact that these gardens have um, for various uh, extension related initiatives. And then the other piece is working closely with um, tribal partners such as Menominee Nation and supporting um, their own um, tribal led food sovereignty work. So, you know, this is where um, extension kind of needs to take a back seat and, and come when we're invited and, and figure out how, um, you know, we can support uh, uh, tribal partners 
by connecting them to UW Madison research resources um, through through grant writing to access um, you know federal technical assistance or funding um, and and in other ways. I did just want to highlight work that uh, again is already um, happening at at Menominee Nation, and you can see here how holistic um, the approach that they're taking is. There's, you know, a, a lot going on here, but um, you can see that it's that this food systems work in the Menominee context is also about, you know, language and culture reclamation. It's about um, intergenerational learning. It's integrated into into gardens and supply chain development. Um, so. A, a very thoughtful approach and a lot of work, um, and and it's really best to leave that to Jennifer to represent, you know, all the amazing things that they're doing there. So I just wanted to close by returning to the community food systems framework, and I guess I should say that it's my hope that as we engage the values in that left circle to inform our approaches um, to the activities in that right center circle. And as we work to change policy, to build wealth in BIPOC communities and to support the reclamation of culture, language and food sovereignty um, that will improve community economic stability and well-being in ways that help undo the structural factors um, that contribute to food insecurity, uh, as well as the racism that underlies it. Um, that, that concludes my portion of the presentation. Thanks so much for the invitation to present. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, we'll transition over now to our second um, highlight of the evening, which is Caleb Locrians and the youth Fresh Start Youth Leaders um, out of the Merrill Community Sharing Garden. And I just, I do really appreciate though, before we move over, Lindsay, the different um, details that were shared. I know in Rock County, we speak you know, a lot about supporting food need and we speak a lot about our agricultural community, but there's a lot going on in the middle that I'm not sure we're always talking about, right? So um, with that, I am really excited to introduce some really great pictures we've been promised. And of course, <laughs> the people that go along with them. <laughs> now I'm under pressure. <laughs> uh, all right, let me just start my uh, screen sharing here. All right, did that come out okay? Okay. All right. So, uh, good evening. My name is Caleb Lokrantz. Uh, I'm the. I'm really lucky to be the um, coordinator of the Merrill Community Sharing Garden. Uh, I am the, going into my fourth year right now of being the coordinator of the of the facility. Uh, so, I just want to give you guys kind of a layout um, before we start really talking about the garden and the purpose, and, and we'll hear you hear from some of my students. Um, I want to give you a general idea of where we're at and what the garden looks like. Uh, um, so um, what you can see in the red right there, those three lots um, are all um, within the heart of the Merrill neighborhood in Beloit, Wisconsin. Uh, we are very lucky that we have three connected lots. Uh, it's, it's a very unique um, situation to have that such a high density uh, residential area. Uh, and this is always really cool um, for some of you who have been there and, and you'll see in the next slide, you know, what it, what it used to look like. And, and for some of you who have been there, um, you'll, this should come as kind of a shock to you to see um, this was the Merrill Garden in 2010. Uh, um, so, and we're actually looking here. So this greenhouse on the right um, is actually where I'm going to go back one slide uh, is actually right here. So the house is gone. Uh, so we have actually reclaimed what used to be um, houses. Um, and one of my students will be talking about that in just a second. Um, but the garden itself, the land has really made a large transition. So this is what it looked like in 2010. And this is one of the pictures of what it looks like now. Um, this was taken last year. Unfortunately, we're just at the time where like, you know, the, I have to use all the nice pictures from last year because everything's still really young right now uh, in the garden uh, for this year. 
Um, we're very um, lucky to use different forms of permaculture and what we grow. Um, we have, uh, there's raspberry bushes along the fence. We have raised beds, we have in-ground beds. Um, there's a mulberry tree, three apple trees, um, two cherry, and a, we just added a couple pear trees too. So we're adding permanent food structures into the garden as well as um, our um, you know, annuals and stuff like that. Uh, so here's another view. Um, so this view right here is actually where that house was. Um, so this is, uh, you know, it looks completely different. Uh, um, and we've done different things with the soil uh, to, to help make sure that we've been able to grow um, food in that area. And then this is the, the view coming in from um, the Nelson side. So this is that single lot that's on the back. So the garden itself was founded in 2008. Um, it consists of three city lots. And like I said, it's located in the Merrill neighborhood. Um, it is considered a food desert uh, and, and it's in a very underserved community. Um, the garden itself is actually, you know, with COVID and, and how COVID has changed so many different things in our lives. Um, the garden itself actually saw a huge uptick of people using the garden for a food source is um, something that I observed from last year. Uh, due to COVID um, and also due to the local grocery store actually shut its doors um, about two, I think it was two years ago. And um, since then, um, the garden has become a more permanent food source for some people. Uh, so right now I'm going to actually turn it over to one of my students, Jacob, um, and he's going to speak for a second. Hi everybody, my name is Jacob Bernal. I'm a Fresh Start student. Um, the Murrow Community Sharing Garden has benefited the community in so many ways. Before the garden was created, there were houses that were filled with drug activity. Those houses were eventually destroyed and were, we were able to turn it into the garden. This helped benefit the community by reducing the drug activity, making the community a safer and, and a happier place. The Murrow Community Sharing Garden also help low-income families get access to free, fresh food. The Merrill Community Sharing Garden also benefits the wildlife and the ecosystem. We currently have a big problem with bees dying off, and with the garden, it helps provide bees with nectar and pollen. Thank you, Jacob. Hi. Um, so I, these are um, we were we actually just added these signs in last year. Um, they were kind of unwritten rules, and then one of the volunteers of, of unwritten rules of the garden, and one of the volunteers actually pointed out to me last year, you know, if you move into the neighborhood, there's no actual rules for, uh, you know, unless you've lived there for a long time, uh, you might not know. Uh, so th the rules that we have for the garden is that the food is free. Um, you take what you need and you leave the rest for others. We're a community sharing garden, so it's set up in a way that um, uh, community action employs me to take care of the garden and to facilitate projects and to teach the fresh art students about growing their own food and, and food security and, and sustainability and all that good stuff. Um, um, we, we tend to see, you know, a lot of community gardens kind of can hit a bumpy road when you have people who are all doing their own plots. Um, because then, you know, some people might lose interest or, you know, some people pay for that type of thing. We're, we are an open sharing garden so that anyone at any time can walk in and just pick anything that they, that they need at that moment. Uh, uh, another rule that we have is to remain on the paths as much as possible to uh, protect the plants and uh, to also respect all forms of life. It's kind of become a joke in the garden now with the students that we have um, a, a literal ton of uh, garter snakes. Uh, so uh, they are always freaking out every time. Uh, but I always have to say, you know, don't kill it, don't kill it, uh, or, or don't mess with it, just let it go. I, um, so um, we try to teach that too, uh, except Japanese beetles. That's, that's the one thing that I say, go ahead and, and take out. Uh, so the, the mission of the garden itself um, is to transform a vacant lot into something of greater beauty and purpose. It's also to create opportunities um, for broader community engagement in the Merrill neighborhood. The Merrill neighborhood has kind of been left behind in Beloit for many years. Um, and there's a lot of different factors that go along with that. And a lot of that was what Lindsay was, was talking about uh, too. You can add in, um, you know, that it's an old industrial neighborhood that when a lot of industrial jobs left, 
um, from Fairbanks, uh, then um, you know the neighborhood kind of um, fell apart with it. Um, the garden itself is actually the lowest income six block radius in Rock County. Um, we've looked and did some minimal research, but we actually think that it's one of the lowest income communities in Southern Wisconsin as a whole. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, and you see stuff like with um, environmental effects with Fairbanks and, and just, and not necessarily Fairbanks, but also like, uh, um, you know, other uh, facilities and stuff like that over the years, um, the, the neighborhood kind of just got fallen behind. Um, another rule is to produce as much fresh produce as possible for our neighbors. It's become a thing, any other neighborhood, this would be a really weird thing, uh, but um, when we have extra produce, we actually go um, with that stuff that hasn't been picked and needs to be picked and, and consumed. Uh, we actually pick it and then we bag it and we just leave bags of produce on people's porches in the Merrill neighborhood. Uh, so they could come home from work someday and they just have a bag of carrots or they might have some tomatoes, okra, uh, whatever um, you know, uh, that we can find. Uh, we also tailor everything that we grow to the neighborhood. So if I get a request to um, put something in, um, I will make sure that I can, if it's reasonable and the climate can uh, handle it, I'll make sure that I fit that into uh, what we're growing. Um, so, in, so in traditional, you know, I, I've gardened for a long time, but I didn't grow okra or tomatillos or collard greens or anything like that. Um, I, I just learned what papalo was. Uh, and um, so, you know, uh, we, we seek that out and, and make sure we can try to provide that for people. So, so now I'm gonna turn it over uh, to one of my students, Jamari. Hi, so the Merrill Community Sharing Garden has basically helped students in a lot of different ways. One of those ways being connecting with our peers and connecting with uh, our community. And it has helped give people a healthier option. Instead of going to the grocery store and buying your produce, you can go to your local neighborhood garden. Um, you can also, like, it's just naturally just brought the community together in general. And it has also helped a lot of students in our program make a difference and set paths for others to make a difference. And thank you. Thank you, Jamari. Uh, so, and we also do, so the Fresh Start students are the main student group that's with me, uh, but throughout the summer, um, the Fresh Start students aren't in session. So um, we actually open up to other area programs too. Uh, and those programs would be the State Line Boys and Girls Club, the Merrill Community Center, Merrill Elementary, and Community Kids. Uh, we're looking to keep expanding that role um, and, and have more uh, groups come down. Um, but uh, it's, it's a really cool thing when you see um, really young youth to also getting engaged and wanting to learn and, and, uh, and, and be a part of, of this. And uh, there's a really great um, um, urban farmer named Ron Finley, who was from uh, South Central Los Angeles. And uh, he was like one of my um, inspirations too for continuing on with uh, when I came out of the Merrill Garden. And he was always famously quoted as saying, you know, um, if you teach a kid to grow spinach, then he's going to be invested in eating that spinach that he's grown. So if you teach uh, someone, excuse me, if you teach someone at an early age about the importance of growing your own food and knowing where it came from and knowing what's been done to it before um, it got to, you, to your plate, then um, that really sparks a lot of interest. So um, we actually do a couple different um, areas of soil management out of the Merrill Garden. Um, we do um, something that uh, uh, we collect a lot of cardboard for people. So um, what we actually do is we reset beds by putting cardboard down and then we put uh, topsoil and mulch and everything. And that kind of helps because the property was left um, to its own for a couple of years um, before I came on. So there's a lot of different weeds that uh, are found on the property. So we've been able to slowly just go bed by bed and reset them by putting this cardboard down, bringing in new soil and starting over. Uh, and it's really become kind of cool to watch that transformation. Uh, another thing that we do is we talk about, and uh, we implement cover crops. Uh, um, cover crops are traditionally seen as uh, something done in large agricultural fields, um, but they are also able to be done um, in small gardens too, or large gardens. Uh, and this picture here is actually crimson clover. Um, it, the students all kind of know it was like, I kept having like a moral crisis because I'm like, okay, 
it's so pretty. I don't want to cut it down, but I'm supposed to cut it down and the bees are loving it. And I'm, you know, I'm like, but I, but then I'm not going to be able to grow food there. So it, it was like, eventually we had to cut it down. But the, the theory behind cover crops is that it pulls really good nutrients out of the air and puts it back into the soil. Um, so this, we actually use cover crops in, in one of the areas where there used to be a house um, on the property. So um, they're actually trying to, we're using it to build the soil back up. And then um, we also use um, like traditional tilling methods, uh, rototilling. And this is Hannah. Um, she's going to speak a little bit later. And she's, um, that was the day she learned how to use the rototiller. Um, so uh, um, it's kind of cool to see, you know, all the students' eyes always get a little bit wider when I tell them, okay, you know, I'm going to teach you how to use a rototiller now. And then uh, it's, it's kind of cool to see that too. Uh, so we, we, when I came on, um, I, I added another mission to the garden and that was to actually preserve the nature, the natural biodiversity of the property and to, to try to protect um, um, one to help the environment and also endangered species, giving species a home. Um, we have designated areas in our garden now that specifically left with native plants or, um, and or with plants that are gonna attract a lot of pollinators. Um, so we're working on continuously adding more and more. Um, this is one of our uh, really, the, one of the more well-established ones. Um, we've been really lucky that uh, throughout the years, we've had a couple um, um, private donors and we've had a couple um, donations from the Rock County Conservationists and a couple other different groups that have been helping us give us native plants so we can restore them back um, to the property as well. And we've also added birdhouses and, and um, I'm working on trying to get a bat house out there as well. Uh, so we have um, one of the cool, these are two different experiences that I really wanted to, to point out for the students and that one of them is that we have a greenhouse that we were really lucky to have that an Eagle Scout actually built it. Um, it's not a huge greenhouse, but it's big enough. Um, you can, I mean, in that first picture there, that's Izzy, our full-time AmeriCorps member. Um, she, you know, you, from where the picture is taken is the door and then you can see the back. So it's not a small or it's not a big greenhouse, but it really is crucial in helping us get a lot of plants uh, going and um, getting us a head start and providing people with food. Um, we uh, do a lot of different things with the greenhouse where like I'll teach the students, you know, you learn about um, different varieties. We always use um, heirloom plants. That's like our, our number one goal too, is that we use heirloom plants and non-GMO plants um, open pollinated so that that way um, we could collect the seeds and I'm working on continuing to collect seeds um, uh, as a future program too. Uh, the Three Sisters Garden uh, is a, um, you know, this is really uh, relevant to what Lindsay was speaking about earlier about um, um, land uh, dislocation and, and uh, you know, with, with Native Americans, uh, we lost a lot of that traditional knowledge. Uh, and one of our really cool teaching gardens is a Three Sisters Garden and that's where they, they grew corn, squash, and or pumpkins and running beans uh, together in harmony. And there's a whole beautiful story. If you Google uh, Three Sisters um, Garden, it's a, it's a beautiful story about um, why they did it and how they did it and um, how people are trying to bring that, that back. So now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my last student who's with us tonight, uh, Hannah. Hi everyone. <laughs> so, one of my personal favorite things about the garden is actually the murals we have. They were painted and donated by the local college students in Beloit, which are currently hanging in our gardens, as you can see from that picture. Our outdoor classroom is available to all of our community, and we got the classroom using a grant from SSM, and Community Action has been in the process of building it from scratch for two years now. We have built benches and a chalkboard, creating plenty of space for an outdoor learning environment during COVID. And this outdoor classroom also provides learning opportunities for nutrition classes for everyone. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, uh, yeah, so the classroom is a really cool added aspect that we've, that we've put in. Um, we had kind of a dead space in our garden that was really shaded. Um, so we talked about adding in um, 
this new classroom so that um, outside groups will be able to come back in and, and enjoy the garden um, and also that we'll be able to host classes out there as well. Um, I'm hoping to be able to continue to provide guest speaking opportunities for people um, where they can come out and speak at our classroom and maybe speak to my students as well. Uh, so we we were lucky. We were um, through COVID. It was very hard. Uh, we um, couldn't have volunteers for a while, but we were very concerned with um, trying to make sure that we continue to provide fresh food and healthy food for people because a lot of people were depending on it. Um, so um, we were able to get um, a lot of nice um, coverage from it. Um, and then uh, the SSM grant help that we got was crucial. Um, it helped us do a lot of different things, not only building the classroom, but expanding the amount of food that we grow, putting a driveway in for when we get soil and mulch delivered um, and a lot of different things. Uh, and then speak going off with the um, recognition, um, it was really cool. Um, we were able to um, get uh, recognized by the governor. Um, and that was a, it's a really cool feeling because then when we have stories that the AP picked up the story um, and then the governor tweeted about it. And that's something that I can show my students and say like, you know, you're a part of this and, and you're, you're taking these huge positive steps and people are realizing it and they're recognizing it. So um, we actually have uh, community garden days. So the public is open to come in at, um, whenever they want. Uh, the garden's always open. Uh, but we have designated days on Saturdays where uh, people can come in and um, I'll be out there from 9 to 12, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, and just to talk or volunteer or just to see how things are going. Um, and uh, uh, hey, sorry. uh Catherine, you're you're not muted. That's uh that is my uh fiance with my six-month-old daughter. I uh, uh that was really cute. All right, so, so I uh, um, we, I, uh, um, the, another picture here is that, uh, we have, uh, you know, um, the, this picture on the right, of course I had to take an opportunity. That's the corn from our three sisters garden. Um, it actually got, we measured it last year. It got to be, um, 10 feet tall. So it was actually getting taller than the greenhouse itself. Um, I try to push people's boundaries out there too with the, with the types of food that I grow. So I grow things that aren't traditionally used in diets. And then I also grow uh, things that are, um, you know, unique. So like this year in our three sisters garden, we have red corn. Uh, and uh, last year we had green kernel corn. So it's, it's things that, you know, we're so used to what we see in the supermarket and there's so much more variety out there and to uh, um, kind of get people used to that. Uh, uh, we, uh, um, you know, we, like I said, all the stuff that we grow is heirloom and, and um, open pollinated, but we've been really lucky because we get donations from Seed Savers Exchange and high mowing organic seeds out of Vermont. Um, and uh, that's been really uh, great because then that is a huge part of our budget then that we cannot um, have to pay for and we can, uh, can, you know, get started and spend that somewhere else. And uh, these are just some more photos. Um, these are actually, uh, most of these are from this year. Um, uh, the one on the uh, right above the community action logo was our last community garden day. Um, and it was really great. It was the largest uh, participation rate that I've, I've had uh, as a community garden day. We had 16 people show up, uh, you know, and only three of them came together. And so it was like all these people were coming and it was, it was just amazing. Uh, and it's really cool because now that we have this garden built back up and built and running, um, you know, we uh, are able to see this community investment and community involvement, and, and it brings everything full circle because that's that's what the whole point of the garden is about. Uh, so I just want to thank you uh, all very much for having us tonight um, and giving my students this opportunity. This is a really cool opportunity for them as well, um, and um, I, I look forward to questions in the future. Thank you, Caleb and Hannah and Jacob and Jamari. I really appreciate it. And I know everybody listening here and on the recording um, does as well. We will be moving into the question and action question and answer shortly. Caleb, could you stop sharing your screen so that I can yes. put the action slides up quickly? Thank you.
So before we move into the question and answer, we do want to share our call to action slides that we always do. We are sharing them at this point because it's possible that you'll have questions um, of our speakers related to these slides. And I would just say, because I'm doing the same, breathe deeply, right? You might be like, whoa, that's a lot of information that I never knew before. And I feel like I like I don't know very much, right? And all you can do is just start. So the first, what can I do like always is to self-educate. Like um, Caleb was saying, make an effort to know where your food comes from. And that can mean anything from growing the food yourself to researching the companies you buy from to finding local options, right? And we have some um, local options that are listed there. Take advantage of those educational opportunities. Obviously the Merrill Community Sharing Garden is one. There are others where you can grow a little extra if you're already an experienced gardener and donate to local food pantries. Um, plan a row for the hungry and Cornerstone of Hope um, are examples of that. And don't worry, I will put all the links into the chat after I'm done screen sharing. There are also um, websites that can help you make those food choices that might reduce harm. And so you can research them and then make purchases accordingly if that's something that is um, possible for you and your budget, right? And then local experts abound. The one there um, is a former local dairy farmer, but there are so many out there, like Lindsay was speaking, we just need to do a better job of connecting with the people who already have a lot of answers, right? Um, donate with purpose. Our, and I know I have several of my colleagues on this program tonight, which is wonderful, but food, and FoodWise in Rock County has been working really hard with local pantries to incorporate strategies from the Safe and Healthy Food Pantries project, right? Some of the key bullet points are listed there below. We need to donate intentionally when we are choosing um, to contribute to those in need in our community because it really does matter. Um, and then organize and advocate, right? As Lindsay showed us, there are different breakdowns in all facets of the food system and there's different ways we can address them. So reading about successful change is a really great place to start. And I have a few examples there. And also I know as Lindsay emphasized, work in partnership, right? That's what it takes. It takes a, a group effort to really move things forward. What can I do for the youth focus? Um, and many of you might notice that DAT programs have picked up this youth focus piece um, over the past programs of this year. And I think the youth who are on this program tonight really exemplify why that matters, right? Youth are not passive participants, nor are they blank slates in our communities. They know things, they are passionate about things, and they're willing to put the work in to create positive change for issues that they're seeing. So with youth in your life or youth that you know, or for people who you know that work with youth, again, self-educate, right, about food, nutrition, different types of agriculture. We have some great resources in this community. Again, I listed the Sharon Garden, Janesville Community Center has a Janesville Urban Farmers Association. We have great environmental centers, um, you know, like Wealthy that's um, listed there because it's not just about the food piece, right? It's part of a whole ecosystem that we're really working with. Um, Again, learn from your preferred media. And you know, the youth I work with, like a whole bunch of different things. I went on before this and I went into the Hyper Public Library's virtual can canopy.com and put food systems in. Whole bunch of stuff came up. There's also great fiction and nonfiction books. Some of those are listed there. Again, like we said at our program in April, practice service learning and advocacy. It's not just about donating to donate something, get to know what places need. And practice the process, right? Identify that youth advocates for community health curriculum that I mentioned is really about identifying goals, taking action steps, and then evaluating how it went, right? And there were also some great examples of doing that on learningforjustice.org, which was previously teaching tolerance. And finally, youth share your voice, right? And encourage others to do the same whether that's because you have unlocked a passion within you doing the work, like maybe these youth leaders are doing right now, and they go on to have jobs that are integral um, in many of these different food system pieces, or simply continue to step up when communities ask for your input, right? And I still listed the community health assessment that's there at the bottom. So I am gonna put all of those resources into the chat now and we will officially open up our question and answer portion. 
So please put those questions into the chat um, and we will work through what people are looking to learn more about. And I'll have those resources in the chat here in one moment. And your questions can be for Lindsay or they can be for Caleb or any of the youth on the call. Also, as we encourage, if others have different resources they'd like to share on this topic, you can certainly use the chat for that too. I have a question for Kayla. So just an idea that popped into my head this evening. I have, has anyone from the garden considered like running camps? Because that is something I would pay for to have my children regularly spend time learning how to grow things. And that could be a nice fundraiser um, for the garden. That's, thank you, Amy. Yeah, that's, that's a really good idea. Uh, right now we've We've partnered with other camps, um, but we haven't done one ourselves. Uh, so, um, you know, we've partnered with the after school program at the Merrill Center. Um, we've partnered with uh, um, community kids, uh, the um, Community Actions Daycare Center in Janesville. Um, we've partnered with the Welty Environmental Center um, where they've come out and used our site uh, as a location as well too. But I, I think it's really cool. And I really like that idea. Um, uh, I, I definitely think that, uh, you know, right now the garden, um, the only employee of the garden right now is myself. Um, but I, I think that it would be like that's somewhere where we can take that in the future um, when we have more staff as well, too. Thanks, Caleb. Um, Caleb, I think that Neil accidentally private messaged me this because he said, Caleb, has there been vandalism at the garden? Has there been what? Vandalism. Um, so, you know, th this is a good question, um, and, and it's a very complicated question. So um, the, the short answer is yes. Yes, there has. Um, but, um, you know, I look at it when I first started, um, there was some vandalism that happened because it's always it's wide open. You know, anybody can come in at any time. Um, but I look at it as the garden is going to have the same problems as the neighborhood that's surrounding it. So the garden is there as a resource. Um, at first I was getting really frustrated. And to be honest, the, the vandalism that happened was just, it's just youth. It's youth that have, you know, not, not uh, like my students age youth, but who are younger. Um, and, uh, um, you know, they have nothing else to do. So they're, they're, I'm a huge advocate for more after school programs, more um, things uh, to get people involved. Uh, the other thing is uh, since students have gone to virtual learning, um, I've seen a lot more kids out in the neighborhood. Um, and then uh, that kind of all throughout the last year, um, that kind of created a very open space for, for kids to just kind of be able to do um, whatever they want. So um, it, that, that had a little bit of an uptick with that too. And there was, there was also a question a little further up in the chat um, about having beehives. It says, if I heard Jacob correctly, are you planning on having beehives at the Merrill Community Garden? So I think I think it's a really cool idea, but because of the vandalism aspect, I don't know that because the garden is always open, my fear is that some kid is going to come and knock the beehive over and then get stung, you know. So uh, just because of a, a liability um, and safety, um, you know, since the, the, I'm not always out there, there's never always, so, someone out there who's an adult uh so because of that reason we haven't done it um but i would love to be able to do it in a safe way uh we would just have to navigate that there have been there's some other um you know compliments obviously in the chat and then there's a question about community classes caleb and team i'm wondering if there are community classes related to the garden or will be in the new built area 
Yeah, so um, that's actually something that we're going to continue to keep expanding on. Uh, right now, um, we, we haven't added any um, classes of our own, um, but we're, we're reaching out for other partners to be able to host classes in our classroom. Uh, so, uh, um, and that's mainly, that kind of goes back to, to um, Amy's question too. Um, it's because I'm, I'm spending a lot of my time with the Fresh Start program and with the Merrill Garden itself, um, it's been harder to kind of schedule that. Um, but I would say that when we have those uh, kid groups, we end up doing something in a class structure, but that's more tailored to, to you know, younger youth. Um, but uh, I, I, I would be totally open for that. It's something that's on my radar, um, and I'm continuously trying to um, expand on that. I, I will say that if you're ever interested in looking at updates, um, the place that you can find the most updates the fastest is on our Facebook page at the Merrill Community Sharing Garden. Uh, we have we post updates there almost daily during the summer. Some more recognitions in the chat, um, which I believe is referring to the the Janesville um, group that I mentioned earlier, the urban farmer piece in the fourth board. So thank you for that. And then question, are there further lots to expand to in the future? And I assume that's for, um, for Merrill. Yeah, so um, we have the three right now. I, um, if, if it was up to me and if I had the manpower and, and the time, every vacant lot would be some sort of food source. Um, but, you know, we're, we're going um, to gonna continue to, to keep working <coughs> on that. Um, we've been trying to help. Uh, we've actually partnered a little bit with Janesville Urban Farmers. Um, this kind of combines both of those last two things, Aaron. Uh, um, we've been working with uh, Janesville Urban Farmers. We've been working with St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Beloit. Uh, we just donated, we grew from seed and then donated some plants, my students did, uh, to the church uh, so that they can use them in their own community hay bale garden that they're growing. Um, and, and that is also a community sharing garden. So. Uh, um, uh, they're actually always going to be open as well um, for, as another food source. So um, we're, um, we're always going to reach out and, and I'm always willing to take phone calls about, I have people reach out all the time and say, hey, I'm interested in starting a community garden and, and I'm willing to help out in any way possible. There, there's a really cool partnership that's happening right now um, that we're, it's still in the very, very um, um, early stages, but uh, between Head Start and Community Action uh, and the Welty Environmental Center. Um, to try to create another community, a large community garden at the Head Start location um, in Beloit. Um, that's, and for those of you who don't know, that's the old Beloit Catholic High School. So they have a ton of space behind their facility. Uh, so um, we're looking at different ways that we can kind of try and um, expand and help, help them as well. And then more of just a logistical question, how does the garden get water? That's, that's a very good question because that's a very crucial question to the garden. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to let, um, does one of my students want to answer? I, one of you can, I don't want to do, uh, but if you don't want to, I, I'm seeing some, some scared faces staring back right now. So, <laughs> okay, I, I'll take that as a, I'll answer. So, um, uh, we, um, we have a, a, a pump that's, uh, that's a, a spigot that's actually located, um, at the, um, porter side of our garden. Uh, and the, the only problem is though, is that it is in the far corner of the garden. So that is our only water source. So we connect four or five hoses together and then drag them, you know, across all the different areas. We have, we're working on getting, um, rain collection built off of the shed, uh, that we have. Um, I, I also, sh I have to mention this because I was, I was reprimanded by my students that I did not include a picture of the shed, uh, and, and the, the PowerPoint, because we just painted it like a bright, almost in your face, baby blue. So it really stands out. I um, mean, my students just did that. Um, uh, so, um, you know, we're, we're trying to do rain collection off of there, uh, but we're, we're still working on that. That's a future project. I um, mean, even then, you know, it's a small, it's an, eight by eight shed. So the amount of water that we're really going to get off of that is probably minimal. Um, but uh, we, 
I'm looking at trying to add another water line on the Nelson side of our garden too. So I actually have a question, I think for Lindsay, now that I've heard so much about the garden project specifically. So if we think about something like this garden as an example, right, of a best practice that's growing, what happens to move something like that into something that's you know more of a broader reach, right? With some of those other pieces you were talking about. I mean, can something like that build into some of those other pieces or does that work generally start somewhere else? Um, I mean, in some ways that's one of the questions that we're trying to answer with some of the evaluation work that we're gonna do with gardens um, in the Milwaukee area in particular this summer is trying to understand through um, a process that we call ripple effect mapping, what the impacts are. And, you know, I think youth development is a great example. Um, there's some great projects that deal with formerly incarcerated folks where um, gardens become sort of an opportunity for re-entry. And, you know, gardens are kind of these optimal classrooms because, you know, everything can be translated to some kind of learning, whether it's about business development or biology or, you know, really you name the topic. And so we're, we're trying to dive deeper into that to understand, you know, what is gained through these, these garden classrooms. Um, with access to, to land, some of the larger plots that I was talking about for these market gardens, those individuals actually are selling at farmer's markets. And so for them, um, it's sort of a, a low cost investment at sort of testing, do they have the production skills? Can they de develop the market? without um, having to actually rent farmland. And then in some cases, um, working with partners such as Fawny Food Center in Milwaukee, they've been able to get access to multiple acres rather than fairly large garden plots. So there's opportunity to scale in that way, um, in that way too. I'd say that those two examples are, are ones that come to mind. And then Stephanie also had a comment. Um, Caleb, you mentioned red corn. What other heirlooms are you trying out this year? And then she makes a reference to the limited grocery store produce um, with the varieties that are grown for shelf life rather than flavor. Because yes, I think as Lindsay pointed out, there are a lot of decisions made in our food system that are made for not optimal reasons, right, for our health. Yeah. So uh, other heirlooms? Yeah, so we have um, so we have that red corn. Um, uh, we have a lot of different tomato varieties. Uh, of course, I can't think of one of them right now off the top of my head. Uh, um, but uh, we have like Clemson uh, uh, spineless okra. Uh, we've started growing out there too, and and um, we were really amazed last year uh, that it was it got like five six feet tall in the air. Um, and, and okra is really pretty in itself because they have beautiful flowers on the plant. So some people grow it as an ornamental plant to begin with. Uh, um, uh, um, it's the other thing too is uh, we do a lot of like uh, herbs. We do a lot of uh, we have like a whole beds designated to herbs. We actually have an entire part of a raised bed that's sole, solely cilantro um, uh, that uh, um, has actually just been reseeding itself every year over and over again. Uh, and I just let it go and I just let it fill the bed because there's so many people that use cilantro out there. Um, it's it, you know it. It's so cool because when I get those seeds donated from Seed Savers Exchange, there's always like just stuff that I've never even heard of that I'm like, what well, you know, I have to look at. Uh, we're gonna grow some Long Island cheese pumpkins this year. Um, we are going to, um, I'm trying to think of what else is out there. A lot of different uh, heirloom varieties of sunflowers. Um, we've actually, sunflowers are a really easy example for what I'm using with the youth when we do seed saving. Um, it's a very tangible, like easy, um, you know, a youth of all ages uh, um, to, to do that, uh, to proceed saving for them as well. I think there's a second part to that, but I don't know if I answered that. I can't remember what the second part was. No, Stephanie shared a, um, shared some information. There wasn't oh. a second oh. part to the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so, so um, <laughs> uh, about the food, the food and shelf life. Um, it's amazing, you know, the amount of people who, like we have um, heirloom strawberries, we have like all, all these things. And when they eat strawberries out of our, our beds, they're like, this is a, like, I have never had a strawberry like this before. And it's because they've always had strawberries that were from the store. 
Um, so, uh, and same thing with the tomato. Like people tell me all the time, they don't like tomatoes. And I, my response is, do you not like, like mass grocery store tomatoes or do you not like actual like organic heirloom tomatoes that have been grown that season? Uh, um, because uh, the, the funny thing too is in the, the Merrill neighborhood, it's a super diverse neighborhood. So there's, it's so, I'm learning so much while I'm out there too, because we have like um, a lot of Hispanic families that will use things that I didn't even know, you know, there was a use for. And then, then usually, um, and it's been, it's been so great. Usually like an older um, Hispanic woman from the neighborhood will come in and then she'll start picking something. And I see her picking it. And I'm like, to me, that's a weed. I'm like, what, you know, what are you, what are you going to do with that? So I, uh, so then she explains it and then, and then we start, you know, and then I start telling more people about that. And I try it myself. Uh, um, we, um, the other thing is with tomatoes, I plant about 80 tomato plants every year. Um, and in the garden, 80 to hundred tomato plants. And, and the, I'm going into my fourth season. So in the three years that I have grown tomatoes out there, I have seen three large red tomatoes. So that means either that people are picking them because they want to take them to ripen or, which is, I think this, the second answer is more prevalent is that there's so many people who want fried green tomatoes in the neighborhood that they're coming out and taking the tomatoes before they even get anywhere near. Um, my first year, I thought it was so cool because I had a whole tomato bed that was like purple, to Cherokee purple and, and white and, and yellow and, 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 you know, dark red, light red never saw any of the color like <laughs> because everybody wanted green tomatoes. <laughs> and we have some more celebrations um, in the chat, which is wonderful. And I hope the youth especially are reading them. And we have about, um, you know, we're wrapping up with less than five minutes to go. I guess I'd be curious from the youth, if any of you think this is something that maybe you'll continue to do, you know, maybe as a profession or once you exit the Fresh Start program, since I know that's a temporal thing, is this? Jacob, I see you unmuted. Um, no, definitely. I think, you know, I love helping the community. So, you know, to be able to go out there and help plant would be a cool experience. And I, this honestly, this has been the first time where I've ever done something like this. And I felt in love with it because, you know, you know, who, who, who doesn't like food, you know, so it's awesome. And so definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, I definitely see myself coming back here. Like I tell my teachers all the time, I'm coming back here next year. I'm coming back here in the summer to help and everything. Uh, I like this because it was a learning experience and I want to keep doing it and helping out. I also feel the same way and I tell Caleb all the time like I plan on coming back in the summer to bug you like I'm gonna be around and plus growing up my mom's always had gardens so I've also kind of been involved that way so I'd be interested in you know when I get my own house and everything maybe investing in something like that of course I'll have to ask Caleb how to do it though. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and, and thank you all three of you for saying that. Uh, and, and um, you know, the hard thing for them is that we have them during the normal academic year. So we get them in August and then they leave in June. So, you know, they, they're missing the entire, like really great part of the garden. So it's, it's always great when the students do come back, you know, who really enjoyed it because they can see all those things that they planted months ago or, or that they started from seeds in the greenhouse and, and, and can get going uh, and see them now five, six feet tall uh, out in the out in the garden. And it looks like maybe our final question for the evening is about donate donating to the garden, Caleb. Um, so if you have information about that, um, please feel free to provide it. You've obviously touched, you know, some hearts here tonight. So Thank you. Thank you. I will put it. Um, I will put it in the um, chat. And when you go to select, you'll get an option. Um, Community Action has a lot of different programs uh, in the area. Um, and then the one for the garden is the Merrill Community Sharing Garden. Wonderful. So once again, uh, thank you for all those questions and answers. I know Caleb says he's generally available for more as they come. Um, obviously that's true for any of the pieces that, you know, Lindsay 
presented on as well. Um, if people had more info, need, wanted any more information about those pieces or how to continue working on them, we absolutely can follow up. It's definitely something within our office um, that we're looking at. And just as a final closing, we always want to give you an update about what's coming up. Remember that the recording of this program will be, will be posted on the H, the Hyper Public Library YouTube channel, and there is a playlist for the Diversity Action Team program. So if you've missed another one, feel free to go back and look. You can always check um, the website and partner Facebook pages for other upcoming events and registration. There are pieces shared all the time, um, and of those pages that also includes the Allies of Native Nations Facebook page. There's a lot of great um, opportunities there. And we have talked a lot about um, indigenous culture tonight. So check out a food opportunity. Um, on those places is also where the links and the action steps will be posted again. So if you're interested in contributing to programs, this is the end of this program year. We're always looking for more people on the programming committee. and that includes youth. So if you think that you have programs to champion or know people who know people who know people who are doing great things, um, that committee would love to have you. And I'll let Amy speak to the final piece because I think she has a couple of others to add to that. Thank you, Erin. Um, so just some upcoming community events. The first is Monday, May 24th at 5.30 to 7, which is Black Maternal Health, the Risk of Becoming a Mother. So that is our May topic for Courageous Conversations. And then also the YWCA Rock County is hosting our Spring Lunch and Learn on Thursday at May 27th um, from noon to 1. And we're hoping that you can join us for the race to equity, the process of creating um, the Rock County Report. So we are very pleased to have Erica Nelson and Stephanie Munoz um, of Kids Forward who helped to author the Race to Equity Dane County Report. Um, join myself for a conversation. So with that, that, I believe that concludes our program tonight. Um, thank you again to all of our presenters and our partners and for all of you for attending um, and for caring about food. And have a great night.